Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This show is about sitting down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. From every province and territory, we have you covered municipally. And over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with City of Woodstock, Ontario, Councillor Kate Leatherbarrow. But before we get into today's episode, I just want to ask you to do a favor for me, if you can. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that follow button. Your following and subscribing to our show makes me understand that municipal issues are not just important to me, but they're important to you as well. So if you can, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Now, on to our interview with Councillor Leatherbarrow. Um, Kate, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. But I want to start with sort of the general question that is this show. And you're no exception to this question. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Kate? Well, first and foremost, thanks for having me, Chris. I'm really happy to be here virtually. Um, And my story is a long one and very interesting, as I would assume most are. Um, but I wasn't sort of the the typical, you know, I was um, what really started my flame was in 2017, um, I actually came across some imagery uh, from a anti-choice group that I was unfamiliar with. Um, and it was quite traumatic, that experience. And my first course of action was, how do I deal with this? And why is this in my community? And what does this mean? And so from there, I took it upon myself to contact the the mayor at the time. And then from there, I created a petition. And from there, I was a delegation before council. Um, And so I really started to dig into the municipal process, which I had no understanding of. Um, I would say that I've always been strong and opinionated, but not uh, labeled political. But it really came down to when I was before council with my five minute delegation to express my concern about the larger community seeing false images like this and the impact it has on women. um, I didn't see myself around the table and I was dissatisfied with the end result of of that discussion. Um, And so that's really how it began. It, It almost fell directly into my lap and impacted me. And then I started to dig deeper on how does this all work? Who is representing me? And from there, I just stayed the course. Now, it, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and I, I apologize to paint a broad stroke, but it sounds like uh, you didn't really have much of a, a municipal experience prior to that 2017 experience. Um, no. Was politics discussed at the dinner table? Did you understand the democratic process that was municipal politics before that 2017 meeting? Or was it relatively a fully green moment for you getting in front of that council and talking and giving that delegation? Well, again, Chris, I would say I've always been opinionated and bold. um, And I was aware of politics. I mean, often I think municipal politics is overlooked because of party politics. So certainly aware of, you know, your prime ministers and my parents took me to to vote and and I was an active voter once I was of age. So yeah, those things certainly were part of my, you know, around the kitchen table family conversations. Um, But yeah, it it was just this municipal realm. Um, And to this day, I firmly believe that municipal politics is your backyard. It is your um, local government. And I think, of course, it is one of the most important of where you can influence change. So yes and no, I guess. Yes, I was familiar with politics and party politics, but no, I was not familiar with specifically municipal politics. Now, this is a very special occasion for yourself, because one year ago today, as of recording this episode, you were elected as a city councillor for the city of Woodstock. Now, I I wanted to go back to that 2022 election for a few minutes, if possible. Um, I just want to make sure that I got this right. This was your first election that you ran and that you put your name on the ballot, correct? No, actually, Chris. So um, when I mentioned in 2017, that's kind of how things got started. In 2018 was a municipal election. Yeah. So so I didn't know if you would have put your name forward during that. Yeah. And again, (laughs) 
everything kind of happened. I'll use the word organically, but it was, as I said, the delegation process. And then it was the Women's March I was putting together in Woodstock, uh, January of 2018. And through the Women's March, I found about these municipal campaign schools specifically for women to get them to run a good campaign, canvas their community and put their name on the ballot. So yes, I actually ran in 2018 and I lost by 59 votes. And so I carried that 59 votes, Chris, for four years and ran in 20, uh, 2022 and, and came out with the most votes. So it's certainly, you have to, you have to be patient and stay the course. You really do. What did you learn about yourself during that campaign period, particularly in 2018, that you carried over to 2022, that you adapted and made yourself a better candidate in 2022 to be successful? Well, I think that name recognition is huge. Um, the city of Woodstock has a population now of about 50,000 people. And so I was born here, but I didn't grow up here. And so um, my family and I moved to Woodstock almost 10 years ago from the city of Guelph. So name recognition was huge. I enjoyed um, door knocking. I enjoyed, you know, being putting myself um, on social media for a platform, but I really enjoyed engaging with residents. So that was kind of my foundation of running a good campaign. Um, but we are a citywide council, Chris, so we don't have wards in the city of Woodstock. So that's a lot of doors to knock on. So I just used a sharper strategy in 2022 to continue to do what I enjoyed, which was to reach out to the residents, but to knock on as many doors as possible. Um, and there was a bit of controversy between 2018 and 2022, because unfortunately, in the year of 2021, a councillor um, had passed away uh, suddenly because of health, and it was it was very tragic. And so because I was the runner up procedurally, council was advised to fill that vacant seat with the runner up. And that's not what happened. So whether it was intentional or not, I continued to stay in the front of people's minds, continued to advocate for what I felt was the best for the city of Woodstock. Um, but I also share joy and passion in bringing people along. So bringing more candidates to the ballot in 2022 and really to raise awareness of how to run a good campaign. Uh, Woodstock is small town, but meets city certainly with our population growth, but further to that, not a lot of people were familiar with candidates being at their front door. So I wanted to create that change for myself, but so people knew what it looked like to have a good, healthy, positive local campaign. You get elected in 2022 in your first term. And over the last year, I can imagine there's been some challenging votes that you've had to make. There's some challenging days uh, around the city council table. And you have to wear that because you put your name forward and you have to make the tough decisions that will impact people. As you said, you are the government that is in the backyard of everyday people. You are the government that has the biggest impact. While it may be forgotten about, you have the biggest impact on the day-to-day -day lives of the residents of Canada, particularly the residents of Woodstock. How do you balance that? How do you weigh those decisions when you go into that council chambers, knowing that the decisions you're about to make, the motions that you're about to put forth, the, the votes you're about to pass are going to impact your residents, good, bad, or indifferent? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say two things. The front of my mind is always community engagement. Um, so whether it's campaigning or now in the role, Deputy Mayor Lindsay Wilson, who is my right hand, we always said to one another, campaigning is different from the role. And now that I'm in the role, I still cannot do this job without community engagement. And what do I mean by that? That means sharing and providing information on how this all works, talking to residents that either are agreeing with me or disagreeing with me, but making sure that I'm sharing that democratic role, because yes, I was sent to do the job on behalf of the residents, but I can't make these decisions as hard and as um, positive as they, as they are at times, because it really can fluctuate, certainly in today's society. Um, but community engagement is at my very core, and it really, really helps me 
fill my full seat. And the other piece I would say is I'm really good at time management. Um, I am prepared. I do my homework. I reach out to, we jokingly have referred to our municipal butts, but I have elected officials across uh, the province to be able to compare notes, to be able to talk about strategy, to be able to consistently take time to think it through and make an informed decision. So those would be my two pieces on how I come to each meeting and how I come to each vote. I, I want to talk about the engagement factor for a second, because um, like you prior to 2017, you knew about politics, you knew about municipality, but you weren't probably actively involved. Are you finding that today? Are you finding that people are not actively engaged there's an apathy around municipal politics when you try to engage people with the issues that are facing your community and you're trying to get their feedback or are people willing to give you their feedback and willing to tell you how they how you should vote or shouldn't vote on certain issues when it comes to a local level mm -hmm. i would say that i think there is an appetite i don't feel um residents are disengaged However, I do think that there is a large population in Woodstock that could be new, could be returning to, to for various reasons. But because our community is changing in population, I do think that there is, you know, almost that untapped resource of how do we encompass new people or people that have chosen Woodstock to, to lay their roots down. Um, but I do find that the way I share information I try to do it in bite-sized pieces because let's be honest, Chris, politics is changing faster than we can blink these days at all levels. Um, but I would say that I try to be as um, engaging and interesting so that it is digestible and therefore it allows for conversation. It allows for community feedback and engagement. Um, but, but there is that, that, I don't know if we want to call it the gray area or the untapped area of we still have a responsibility to to tap into those residents, whether whether they're new or they've been here for five years through the pandemic and they're just finding outlets within the city of Woodstock now. Um, but I take that responsibility really, really seriously. Right. How so? Um, I, I almost look at it. I'm a small business owner, too. Um, and, and Oxford County is the region where Woodstock um, is. We are the largest municipality in the entire region. And I think the region is between 115,000 and 120,000. Don't quote me on that, but over 100,000. And I look at it like small business because I am a small business owner. But when I moved to Woodstock, I worked for a small business first. And the way people support local or if you met somebody new that was inquiring about somewhere to go to eat or a local butcher or a coffee shop, it was just natural to fill them in on all the best places. So if I do meet people that are new, um, I usually provide them with where to take your kids because I have four children. So I'm always trying to equip people with where to take the kiddos to keep them busy. Um, where are the local eats and the gems, the hidden gems? but also talking about the changes that Woodstock have seen, not has seen not only in the year that I've been a counselor, but in the 10 years that I've lived here. So always sussing that all out, but always keeping that responsibility hat on saying, let's bring everybody in together, you know, let's, let's inform the people. Um, so yeah, I look at it as like support your local small businesses and support your local municipal politics. When people do stop you, though, when people do talk to you and have questions about what's going on and the issues that they're bringing forward to you, do, is there an understanding of the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays compared to the province or the federal government? When I when I mm -hmm. when I've spoken to many municipal leaders and I've done this a few times, uh, there's a there's a gambit. There's people who say, yeah, mm -hmm. there's people who just don't understand the jurisdictional roles. I'm getting asked about provincial matters or federal matters on a daily basis. And then there's some who say, no, people have a better understanding than you might think about what the municipality does and why they should go contact their MPP or their MP compared to their local city council in Woodstock for you in your role in the last year. What's been your uh, sort of feel of people's understanding of the jurisdictional roles that municipalities play compared to the other levels of government? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I'll add an extra layer of, of what could be confusion is that we also operate in a two tier uh, government system in Oxford County. Um, so even something as like your waste collection, uh, that can be awfully confusing at times. But to your point, whether I'm reaching out to the county um, of Oxford table, obviously, I have peers around my table that then go above to the other table, because there's a, your lower tier and your upper tier. Um, but if anybody needs to go to the different level of government, I don't just say, well, message your MPP or your MP. I will directly reach out to them to, again, strengthen that relationship for myself, but then to also help myself understand who is responsible for what. But then again, redistributing that to the community. Um, so far, it has served me quite well. If there's an issue about waste, you know, it's finding the right staffer, it's finding the right level of government, it's finding, you know, kind of that that string of I can be known as bias for action, but where is the action item and how can we collectively find that solution for the resident? I do think that the resident has a role to play um, because we can't, as a human being, we can't be all of the things for all of the people, right? What? But Come again, on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, you can. <laughs> Come on. You're a city councillor. <laughs> joking. Know. I'm joking I aside. No, for sure. I know. They don't even talk about that in um, in partnership, right? Like your, <laughs> your life partner shouldn't be all of the things. You should have different uh, relationships and friendships and all of those things. But Hence why you have the yeah, municipal just, old buds. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, my husband's pretty good at talking shop, but you know, I save certain things for the for the municipal buds chat. So um, but yeah, and then I really log as much as I can, Chris, in terms of if I'm talking about taxes and how is it distributed and understood with the two tier government system. Um, because I always was told, well, it's a steep learning curve, which I think is just trying to intimidate you intentionally or not but it's all what you make of it. So I log everything that I learn and then residents do as well too. I mean, even just explaining how to be a delegation before council, even explaining how to draft an email to various levels of government. Um, these are all things that I'm hoping others are also banking um, because I certainly am and, and we'll refresh and recircle it to people. If there's interest and appetite, let's let's do it together. You've been in the position for one year now, and I can imagine from being that being in front of council in 2017, making that delegation to now being the person that people are giving delegations to is kind mm -hmm. of an eye opening experience because you're now hearing people's mm -hmm. concerns left, right and center. What's been the biggest eye opening experience over the last year? Because there are municipalities across this country right now who are about to head off to elections in one year time. So they're gearing mm -hmm. up. What advice would you give a prospective candidate or mayor candidate or council candidate to say, if you want to be good in the job, this is what you need to do? Is there any advice that you would give? <clears throat> well, it's interesting because I feel like every municipality is so uniquely different, even from like their procedure bylaw to agendas to when their meetings are, how long their meetings are. So we are all very unique. But what I would say in advice is really sit down and ground yourself, kind of how you're asking me, Chris, what got me to this position, what is important to you, but really ground yourself and have a target of what you want to accomplish. Do not promise the sun and the stars and the moon because there is a, I wouldn't say it's a secret, but there is this, um, maybe we will, we will use the word secret. There's, there's kind of this unspoken term that you know you have to work together if you actually want to get some of your priorities accomplished you have to work together you have to be willing to maybe step back a little bit step forward a little bit uh pull a little here pull a little there so i would just be very very specific in what you want to do um when i referenced community engagement that may be a very different definition for other people, but I really want to educate the public so that I am doing the right job, but I'm also holding the door open for other people and I'm engaging people in municipal politics that's only going to serve us better in the long run. And we're going to eliminate that apathy if it is out there for other communities. So being precise and true to who you are as an individual, what you're saying at the door, 
um, again, door knocking, canvassing, if, if, if you are, if you have the ability and if you have a, a solid team and you feel safe to do so, you will hear what the people want. You will hear and fine tune why you should be running and how your personal qualities or traits can impact change based on what you're hearing at the door. So campaign really, really hard, but be honest to yourself and don't promise things that you just aren't sure you can deliver because that's setting yourself up and residents for disappointment. I want to turn to my one last question before we turn to the second segment where we're going to talk a lot more about community engagement. And I want to talk about the balancing act that you have to go through as a municipal council at the local level. Mm -hmm. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You don't go off to Queens Park to do your job. You're in your community 24 seven. And I can imagine there's days where you just want to go to the grocery store and be Kate. You want to go mm -hmm. to the park with your kids and be mom. But you yeah. know, the moment you leave that door, while it may not be a full-time glorious paying job, you are yeah. Kate Counselor Leatherbarrow every single time mm -hmm. you leave that door. Have you mm -hmm. found that balance of being just mom sometimes and being counselor? Or are you always counselor no matter where you are? I think I'm always counselor no matter where I am in my family. Because I said I have four kids. Yeah. <laughs> my family... <laughs> That's part of my foundational makeup, right? Um, I try to avoid a child having a complete meltdown in public if a resident's talking to me about a budget line. But, I mean, I'm also there because I think families and children also need to be represented. So it's very much, you know, my the reality of, of the role. Um, Have I your kids say, gotten to the point yet where they say, Mom, I'm not coming with you because you're going to be uh, four hours to go get milk? <laughs> <laughs> yes and no yes and no my oldest will be 11 uh next week so I can see that like oh how long are we gonna be what is this looking like where are we going um but they're pretty patient too and and it's absolutely amazing um how much they they're sponges right I mean I've had conversations with my kids about uh people that are experiencing homelessness right and, and again because it's our everyday life and, and our business and, and, and our community. Um, I think that's really beneficial for them. Um, but what I will say too, is that in terms of when I do need to kind of turn it on and turn it off, I've got a really great support system and a couple really close friends that I will have a bottle of wine with and be intimate and vulnerable. And I, and I really value that time. Right. So I do know if things are really, really tough, not always on the bad days, but if, if things are challenging or I'm burnt out, I also know who to go to and, and how to express myself to kind of continue to, to push forward. So there's a bit of balancing, of course, but being stopped in the grocery store with my kids and talking shop, um, I'm definitely both Kate and counselor so and mom. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty there. Uh, I want to turn to the second segment. And before I ask start this line of questioning, I'm going to preface this question by saying, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not even a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion. Don't know why, but we get emails about this question. So yeah. counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Woodstock today? Mm -hmm. Well, and I really appreciate you saying that, Chris, because I do Counselor Corner uh, recaps after each meeting. And I always start by saying uh, I share these videos on behalf of myself because it is important to identify that um, there are opinions and, and so on and so forth. So I appreciate you saying that. But I think one of the biggest challenges for Woodstock is that, as I said, it is a small town that meets city. There are so many small town perks, but we have big city problems. And what I mean by that is the cost of living is outrageous. That impacts every level of government, that impacts every corner of Woodstock. Um, the changes coming from the province right now, not only as a new councillor, but in general, I'm really concerned about infrastructure, I'm really concerned about higher taxes. And I'm really concerned about what could have been deemed as social cracks are now busted wide open from the pandemic and we all are seeing it. And we're definitely seeing that in Woodstock. 
I mean, we use the term mental health and addiction loosely, or we use the term affordability. And, and sometimes those are buzzwords, but I really, really mean them that we do have generation after generation living in Woodstock. And I know from their standpoint, their community has drastically changed. I understand that. I have lived in a larger city. I have only relied on public transit before, right? And those things in a positive way are, are shaping and changing Woodstock. But I do think that that can be where you'll see a bit of divide or you could see divide um, because it's happening so fast. And it is that small town meets city. And, and we have to make sure that transition as we move forward is as positive and healthy as possible for everybody. Growth comes with struggles, and I think you probably know mm -hmm. that more than anyone, but well, mostly most more counselors know that. How do you mm -hmm. see yourself in your role in balancing that growth? Because you're right, growth is good because it lowers people's mm -hmm. taxes. When tax base grows, that means people doesn't don't have to pay large portions. But with growth comes complications, infrastructure mm -hmm. upgrades that need to be done that no one mm -hmm. seems to talk about when we talk about growth. You as a counselor have a vote around that table. You as a counselor have a voice around that table. What are you doing in the short term to make sure that these issues are being presented, but not only presented, but being discussed? Because unless we have these discussions, people are just going to say, okay, we need more houses. Well, housing comes with yeah. infrastructure, wastewater treatments, means that more service yeah. levels at the pool, all this has to happen. So what do you see as mm -hmm. your role in trying to make sure that the issues are being addressed when it comes to growth and infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say I'm persistent. <laughs> I am persistent. Yes, you are. I've like watched a, a few of your counsel. <laughs> um, but I, I truthfully mean that. Um, let's just talk about housing. And I'll use this example because we just talked about this at our last council meeting, which was um, last Thursday. So as I mentioned, there's all these changes from the province pertaining to housing. So there's what we call in Woodstock, again, it can be called different in other municipalities, but ARUs, which is additional residential units. So those are like your, your granny flats, your, your additions, your, your you know, kitchenettes and, and you know, basic shower, or whatever, um, to not only maybe house someone that is in your family that can't get into the market to maybe have additional income for your um, mortgage, lots of different reasons. But I can see around our diverse council, and I say diverse because we are very diverse in age. There are three new councillors um, serving for the first time, and then there are three returning councillors. And then our mayor um, is, is newly elected to the position of mayor, but he has also served two councils. Um, and specifically with the age, you can see how you have to be persistent from my point of view to share what lived experiences are like right now, let's just say with kids, right? And let's just say with, you know, students that have maybe done post-secondary and are coming home and they can't find anywhere to rent. And so that's where I mentioned, Chris, to you, you really have to work together. Um, and, and we're going to have to continue to be persistent of this because even when we were looking at widening the percentage of our driveways to allow for additional parkings for what is mandatory ARUs, additional residential units. You can see the pushback. You can see the resistance of, you know, one counselor could think like parking's been an issue as long as they've served for 20 years. But I can see that moving the needle from 50% to 65% versus moving it to 90%, like, that's just a, a little pull, guys. We, you know, we have to come together on this. So persist, persistency, but but shared lived experience from all of us, I really hope by 2026 will get us to concrete decisions where we are representing such a diverse group of residents in the city of Woodstock. And I hope that answers your question, but that's just an example of, you know, I try to insert it left, right, and center. You know, I try to insert um, what other municipalities have done. And I think that's why I was elected because Woodstock hasn't seen this much change around their council table in a long time. Now, you're right. The, the growth in infrastructure has a very big municipal component where you have to look at the day-to-day -day issues that are being confronted with you. The province has a role to play in this uh, issue as well with housing. Federal government does as well. 
But there's one area that is often overlooked, the residents. The residents have a role to play in growth as well, because there is a rise, and I say this not knowing the answer to this question already, but um, there's a rise of nimbyism in this country. There's a rise mm -hmm. of people who just want things to stay the same. But you as a counselor, mm -hmm. you as a council have to look at every single issue and not worry about the past. You have to worry about the here and now and the future. How do you make sure that you grow the city sustainable and in a way mm -hmm. that people feel like they're not losing their their community that they moved to uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or have lived there their entire life? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is, you know, related to that change can be incremental at best. Um, <laughs> and I don't tend to waff on yes or no. I'm pretty direct based on all of the things I said about being informed and being educated on my decisions. But when we're looking at, I'll use the term that you said, nimbyism. I mean, we live in Oxford and, and Woodstock. We bump up against some prime agricultural land, right? So knowing your residents where we don't want to eat up farmland. So we need to be supportive of additional residential units to some degree, or we also need to be supportive of density. Across Woodstock, we don't have a lot of density. We have more in the last, let's say, five to eight years. Um, but Again, I guess that's where I'm that balance of trying to meet in the middle of if you've said no, 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 but you're kind of sort of yes, humming, hawing over here. Well, then I'm going to try to jump onto that to work together to make that the needle that we're moving. Because, yeah, you have to listen to your residents. And anytime someone comes to the city of um, Woodstock City Council pertaining to planning applications, I think residents are more than aware of the housing crisis that we're in. They always state it. But I also respect that if you've looked out at a beautiful backyard and it's all green space, I know that that can be really challenging to see that potentially change. Um, but again, giving examples, giving lived experiences, asking that question, would you rather a suburbia or would you rather a two or three story? You know, it's it's really trying to help people get to the reality, but get to a place that they're comfortable and then we can all sign on board, right? Like if you don't want a 10 story, are you good with five or six? Because maybe that's what we have to do right now until people get more and more on board. Again, back to that piece of Woodstock having been a town or viewed as a town for such a long time, right? We have to slowly inch some people towards like being an urban center, right? Well, I, I will be the first to admit prior to uh, me reaching out for the love of me, I thought that Woodstock was a town. I didn't realize yeah. it was a city until probably two, three weeks ago when I originally reached I out. I was like, oh, God, it's a city. It shows yeah. you that there's that town mentality. And as someone who yeah. lived in Ontario for some time and grew up in a town, which is now I think is a city or a, or they, I'm not sure if they're called a municipality or whatever they're called yeah. anyway right now, it, 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 there is that mentality of small town feel, big city heart, right? Because you are a city. Uh -huh. But I want mm -hmm. to pick up on a word that you've been mentioning a lot over the last 40 minutes so far, and that's respect. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I want to ask you how hard, not how hard, but you have to listen to all sides of the story, people who disagree mm -hmm. with you and people who agree with you. And there has to be a respect to that component because you have to mm -hmm. give them their time that they feel like they've been respectfully listened. But you have to make sure that you, you're being respected for your time and respect it in your role as well. How do you make sure that you listen to both sides of the story? Because you don't want to just go into your echo chamber and say, okay, John, Sarah, uh, Jane, all three of you, you're going to tell me what the issues are. And you're that's the only three issues that I'm going to deal with. You have to go talk to right. Bob, Amanda, and Keith and say, okay, you may not agree with me, but I have to respectfully listen to you because that's my role as a counselor. How do you see your mm -hmm. role in doing that and making sure that everyone feels like they have a voice or an ear to a counselor leather bear. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say that I have hard boundaries in terms of like the way people speak to me. Um, well, and I respectfully, make that right? Respectfully. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, but I, but I mean, like when we get passionate, I mean, some people, because I'm so naturally loud, some people think I'm angry when I'm passionate. And it's just because I'm, I'm a very loud person. And sometimes I get a little blotchy when I get excited. Um, but language is really, really important, right? So 
I am very receptive to people that don't agree with me or think that I'm making a bad decision. Like, let's just say, yeah, it's coming as a, as a negative uh, conversation. I'm still able to sift through that conversation, be empathetic, listen, um, and try to take that away. Maybe sleep on it. Maybe two days later, I'm like, hey, you know, I didn't think about that the way that they said that that sentence that I was really at first against and thought, what are they talking about? But I really am a good listener, you know? And um, the reason I said the boundaries piece is that whether it's on my social media or whether it's in my emails, I mean, I've, I've received a couple emails that called me quite a few names and I just wrote back saying, you know, I, I refuse to have a conversation if you continue to, or you plan on referring to me as X, Y, and Z. If you decide that you even would after like a to year, have... Sorry, sorry. Even after yeah. a year in office, you're getting these emails. Yeah, very few, very few. Because I think, again, I'm very transparent with who I am and who you're dealing with, right? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I have had a couple emails, even just terminology about social issues. Like language is really, really important to me. And, and when people use the wrong terminology, I try not to take offense because maybe they're not talking about me, but I still will go the extra mile to say, that's actually not what it's called. Let's use this word instead, you know? Um, and I'm not perfect. I, I, I certainly can cuss every now and again too, right? But I just mean that, um, yeah, boundaries is really important, but how could I get into this role and truly respect democracy if I was only going to plug my ears and listen to the good stuff, right? I mean, I was reflecting last night on this one year and so much has happened in one year. I feel like that classic, you know, the duck is just chilling on the water, but then paddling like crazy underneath. Um, but I have received feedback that I don't agree with and it still left some type of impact or shifted my brain slightly to just look at an opposite view differently. You know, don't take it personally. Use it as a tool. So. You're one, and, and I say this respectfully, you are one of the most engaged municipal politicians that I've come across locally in Canada. You are yeah. active on social media. You are giving council yeah. updates. You are sitting there week after week after week <laughs> during those counts, after those council meetings and giving people a, a, an idea, a peek behind the curtain of what's going on in council, because no one's sitting there, unless you're me, watching a three hour council meeting and going, oh, this is so much fun. I enjoy it, but I am, mm -hmm. other people aren't. Why is that part of the community engagement so important for you? Why is it so important for you to reach out to people and say, you know what, if 50 people watch this or 700 people watch this, you're being engaged. You're being part of the democratic process that is municipal government. Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, it, it impacts us so much, right? Like we said, our backyards. But also, I have a couple of friends that really struggle with the language of like through your worship to counselor so and so, you know, that language too can be really confusing and 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 hard to understand. Like just procedure, right? Even planning applications. That's still a spot for me that I'm like, what does you know this mean? And have to go back to my notes. So if I really want change for the next generation and more people to step forward, we have to make this more accessible. We absolutely have to. Like I was kind of touching on this last night in my reflection of. I really, really want more women in leadership roles. I feel like women are so multifaceted. It's not to say that men don't belong in politics. They absolutely do as well. But women can really look at a room full of people and make a decision and almost calculate how it's going to impact all those people in the room, right? It's not like a tunnel decision and, and this is it and that's final, right? Like empathy is so visible in women. And so I feel like how do I entice more women, support more women, engage more women to run. Well, it, it's, it has to be through making the information and the process more digestible and more understandable. And maybe it's a way for me to actually process the role. Like I said, before I was elected, it was just the doom and gloom of, well, it's a steep learning curve. And I hated when people said that to me because it just felt like it was not encouraging me in the slightest. And I refuse to say that to people because it's all what you make of it. But 
yeah, maybe my activity on social media and in person and with staff and with residents is also to further understand how this works and to simplify it. I think we need to simplify it. Like politi politics and leadership make big decisions for lots of people. And if we're going to get hung up on confusing language, how are we going to get more people into the arena? How? How? So, yeah, I try to always bring it back down to my level, bring it back down to simplicity, but truthfully try to understand the role and distribute that information so that I'm getting more people interested. And then I hope more people put their name on the ballot in future elections. Now, I, I, I know I said 45 minutes and we're at the 45 minute mark. Do you have five minutes that we can finish up the yeah, conversation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. I want to chat last... with you all day. <laughs> <laughs> I love these conversations. I didn't realize 45 minutes had passed. I was like, oh God, I haven't got to my third segment yet, but here we are. Um, I want yeah. to ask one last question because I want to pick up on something. You want to make municipal government more accessible to people. You want to mm -hmm. make people make a, make a municipal government more understandable to people. Now, I know mm -hmm. it's only been a year, but I've got to ask mm -hmm. the million dollar follow-up question to that is, how do you think you're doing? Ooh, what a good <laughs> question. I think I'm doing really well. And I think staying to those core values and staying to that number one reason that we've touched on as to why I'm here um, hasn't derailed me at all, right? I think... When I lost in 2018, I'll be honest with you, it took me like a year and a half to get over it. I think that that life lesson of, you know, not making the cut, not making the team, I'm privileged to say this, but I wish that would have happened in my younger years because I was really <laughs> thrown for a loop because I had worked so hard, right? But now that I'm in it, um, I do believe everything's meant for a reason and I'm I'm in a better position in my life to be in this role. So So I do think I'm doing well. Um, there are definitely challenging times, um, challenging other levels of authority and structure is, it can be exhausting. Um, but I'll say those municipal buds and, and my support system, they're always cheering me on. So I do think I'm doing really well to say in short. I appreciate that. I want to turn to my last segment here because I'm okay. cautious of time. And it's my favorite subject because I love tourism. I love visiting places. Oh, yes. And I, <laughs> you were prepared for this. That's great. I love yeah. visiting communities and I'm trying to. If 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 all the stars align next summer, uh, my husband and I will be bringing our dogs and we will be getting an RV and cross crisscrossing Canada and we will be making a stop in Woodstock to visit your community because I've promised a few municipalities in southern Ontario to stop in. So I need to make sure I do that next summer. So I've got to ask the question as a tourist, as people who listen to this show look for places to find in Canada. What are some of the hidden gems in the city of Woodstock that you say, if you come, you need to go here? Yeah. Oh, geez, that's a long list. I don't think I, I wrote out my list, but I'll, I'll say one thing that's really going to sit with you um, for when you visit. Um, and again, it's more regionally than specifically in Woodstock, but it really checks all the boxes. We have through the County of Oxford, what's called Tourism Oxford. And this is a regional funding uh, tourism group that does the best work for experiences in Oxford County, small businesses in Oxford County, trails, um, accommodations, you name it. And when I was telling you, I hope people support small business and support uh, local municipality or municipal politics rather, you know, it goes hand in hand. And so tourism Oxford, because Oxford County doesn't have mountains and cliffs and lakes and all of that, we really rely on our businesses to offer that experiential component, like come to Oxford County, come to the countryside, get a little bit of like townships and municipality and those types of things, but really dive into our local bounty and get that unique experience. So because I have no favorites, as I say, I have no favorite uh, departments in the municipal world. You love them all equally. Um, I just like your kids too. I would say Tourism Oxford is such an amazing resource that is active in partnership, active in locally grown, locally sourced, that if anyone who is listening or yourself just went on their website or social channels, you would see the plethora of amazing things we have to offer in Woodstock, but also Oxford County. 
So I know you said you don't like to pick your favorites, but I'm going to kind of hold <laughs> your feet to the fire here. Okay. okay. Because okay. after a long day, after a stressful day at work, after a long day of council mm-hmm. meetings, after a long day of being mom, where do you go in the city or even in the county to recenter yourself, to refocus mm-hmm. yourself, to make sure you say, okay, it was a long day. It was a rough day, but tomorrow I have to be back at it and I have to give 110%. Where's that? Where's your special place within uh, the city of Woodstock that you can just refocus yourself? Um, I would say there is a restaurant in Woodstock. So I definitely enjoy uh, food and beverage. So I would likely take my husband and we would go to a restaurant called 639. And I believe they've been in business 16 or 17 years. I actually used to work for 639 when I first moved to Woodstock. And it is a farm to table restaurant with only like 30 seats. And it's kind of an older century home, basically. Um, But the food and the conversation and the cocktails really and the space and the service, that would be my go-to place. Um, And they have seasonal menus. So they, they often change depending on which, which season you're in, but that would be my safety net likely a I know the staff really well but the food is it's hard to match 639 food if I'm being honest with you it's just amazing I appreciate that so I I want to end on my last question it's the important question it's the million dollar question that I think every municipal counselor knows how to answer but I think it Mm -hmm. needs to be put on the record and that question is in your opinion what makes the city of Woodstock such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Oh, what's so unique? Well, I'd have to start by leading with the people. Um, we have a lot of caring community residents in Woodstock. And um, I think the expression is like six degrees of separation, but I always say two degrees of separation because a lot of people either know each other or are related or had once you know three removed worked with so-and-so's cousin so there's a real sense of community and unity in Woodstock um I also think we're positioned really really well being right off of the 401 and the 403 um and we have public transit we also have amazing trails in the city so when you come to Woodstock there is Piddock Conservation Area so it's essentially a human-made lake Um, north of the city but the trails and the upper Thames River conservation area it's just it's almost unbelievable that that is in a municipality so the people the neighborhoods the trails um, and we have a lot of dedicated city of Woodstock staff who obviously are doing all of the things of like keeping the parks clean taking your garbage um, customer service at city hall I'm missing all of the departments but We are a strong community. We are. And I think it's a wonderful place to be. And, and, and this is coming from someone that my heart was broken when we left Guelph. I felt so at home there. And my grandmother who traveled a lot in her time, she would say it takes two and a half years to settle into a city. And I was like, Barbara, that's so long. Um, But it's very true. And we have experienced so much um, success, but also support and, and community in Woodstock. So I think it's been, I think it's a great community. Counselor. And the best. And the best. Well, I'm assuming if uh, Cam Guthrie's listening to this right now, he's probably going, <laughs> you you left well for Woodstock. What are you talking about? Anyway, um, Kate, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this, for giving me a few extra moments with you, and for serving your community. Um, I don't think municipal politicians hear that enough, and I, I hope to change that. So thank you so much for stepping up, for being part of your community, and making the tough choices that you have to make on a day to base, uh, on a daily basis when it comes to the betterment of your community. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I I. I... Look forward to more and more podcasts. I think the work you're doing is really important and you're also helping uh, the greater good for future leaders too.